In today's video, we're going to look at Richard's Purge of 1397. So the video is going to be split up into three main parts. The first will look at why Richard decided to strike in 1397 against his uncles and against the senior nobility. Secondly, we're going to look at how Richard was able to crush his rivals. And finally, why he was able to do this unopposed and why he was able to do this so quickly. So firstly, why did Richard strike in 1397? Well, by this point, Richard had arguably built up a cult of personality and perhaps had an egotistical view of himself. By 1397, much of Westminster Hall, which you can see here on the left, had been uh, completed. It had been completed with flying buttresses, much to the design of Kenilworth Castle, and also there had been a number of statues that had been put inside the different spaces between the buttresses. So at home, Richard had a degree of stability, and certainly he had built, built up quite a cult around himself. What he then wanted to do was to expand on his empire and to help out his new French allies. So what Richard did in 1397 was he approached the Commons in Parliament and asked uh, to launch an expedition against the Milanese, who were uh, an enemy of the French. The Commons refused this request. It was very similar to Richard's request that had been done in the 1380s, and he wasn't happy at the judgment. At this same parliament, a petition was given to Richard. This is known as the Haxey Petition, because it was named after uh, Mr Haxey, who was a Nottinghamshire clerk. And within it, Richard's authority was questioned. Within the petition, it said that the great and excessive cost of the king's household should be remedied and reduced. Okay, this criticised Richard's expenditure once again, and as we can uh, anticipate, Richard's response was one of pure anger. Haxey was imprisoned, but later released. But again, Richard's power and Richard's use of his power and use of his expenditure had been questioned. There are plenty of parallels here to 1386 and 1387. So Richard had clearly a bigger sense of himself than in previous years. In addition to that, the Commons had refused his request to grant an expedition and also had criticised his management of the country. Again, though, we have the same two people defying Richard. Gloucester and Arundel had ignored summons by the King to attend a council, and Gloucester was publicly criticising Richard's decision to make peace with the French. Again, we can see plenty of parallels back to 1387. So all of this is playing on Richard's mind. But something happens in June 1397 that makes up Richard's mind to finally strike against these, these members of the nobility that had been questioning his authority. The title for Holy Roman Emperor was up for grabs across the continent, and messages from Germany, which is where the Holy Roman Empire was mainly based, had come to Richard with the suggestion that he could become Holy Roman Emperor. For Richard, this was brilliant. The only problem was that the messengers had said that a number of leading noblemen, uh, noblemen within Germany had criticised Richard's management of his own nobility. And they said to Richard that if he could deal with subjects in his own country effectively, then perhaps he would be given the title of Holy Roman Emperor. It's no coincidence then that within a month Richard had acted against his rivals. But how did he do this and who did he particularly attack? Well, we have to look back at who the appellants were in 1388. Firstly, we have the Duke of Gloucester and we have the Earl of Arundel. These are the two leading figures. We then have some other elder nobility members, which are the Earl of Warwick and the Duke of York, who is again Richard's uncle. And then we have two slightly younger figures, who were these younger appellants in 1388. Henry Bolingbroke, who was John of Gaunt's son, and Thomas Mowbray, the Earl of Nottingham. Well, on the 10th of July, Richard sets up a trap. He invites Warwick, Gloucester and Arundel to a banquet, with Richard leading this in London. Quite wisely, Gloucester and Arundel make up excuses and say that they can't attend, and only Warwick turns up. Warwick is treated with, with honour, and Richard and Warwick uh, chat and, and go through all the banquet procedures throughout the whole of the evening. But as soon as the meal finishes, Warwick is immediately arrested. Richard wastes no time. He has Warwick imprisoned, but he needs to make sure that Arundel and Gloucester are also imprisoned. 
So he sends a force immediately to the Isle of Wight where Arundel is staying and he imprisons him in Carisbrook Castle. Richard himself then rides through the night to Pleshy in Essex to arrest his uncle. Gloucester meets Richard outside of his residence and pleads for mercy. Richard responds with, well, you didn't show any mercy to Simon Burley in 1388. Gloucester is then immediately arrested and he is sent alongside Thomas Mowbray, the Earl of Nottingham, to a jail in Calais to await trial. Mowbray is the person that is in charge of making sure that Gloucester does not escape. So in one night, Richard is able to arrest the three senior noblemen within the country that have uh, acted against him in his reign. So how had Richard been able to do this? Well, Richard had the element of surprise. Had he acted over a number of days, perhaps Gloucester and Arundel might have been able to gather a force of retainers and uh, attack, attack the king. Richard had done this very quickly. He'd done it in the space of one night. He had acted himself. He had been present for two of the arrests and he had made sure that Sir William Scrope, another trusted advisor, had uh, arrested Arundel on the Isle of Wight. Richard had obviously disclosed his plans to a number of key noblemen that he could trust, and this ultimately helped him as well. In his arrest of Gloucester, he made sure that he had a number of senior noblemen that could come along with him in case things turned ugly. This included his half-brothers, the Hollands, Thomas Mowbray, who's the Earl of Nottingham, and the Earl of Rutland, which was York's son and Richard's cousin. So in lesson, what we're going to do is we're going to look at how Richard then treated these three imprisoned noblemen. But there are a number of questions that you need to think about. In the context of his position and the time period, can Richard be condoned for his actions against Gloucester, Arundel and Warwick? How was Richard going to justify his actions to other members of the nobility, particularly people like John of Gaunt and Henry Bolingbroke? Thirdly, why did he do this? And finally, why did Richard not choose to attack York, Bolingbroke, Mowbray or Gaunt himself?